Have we been visited by aliens? Well, David Grush certainly thinks so. On July 26, 2023, Mr. Grush was a former Air Force intelligence analyst and Ryan Graves and David Fravor, who are former Navy pilots, testified in front of Congress on the existence of UFOs or unidentified flying objects. Sometimes these are called UAPs or unidentified aerial phenomena. My goal in this video is not to disparage or discredit the remarks of anyone who testified, but it is to figure out the likelihood of alien visitation based on what we know about the universe and to do it in a way that the intelligence community would. Now, this video is probably going to get shared a lot and seen by a lot of people who aren't subscribers, so let me introduce myself. My name is Ryan Macbeth. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science, a master's in engineering management, and an MSc in cybersecurity. I used to write C4I SR software, which are tools that are used for intelligence collection. Basically, I use technology and software to find bad guys and surveil them to expose more of their network or use more kinetic methods to disrupt their networks. I'm an investigative journalist now, but I still have a foot in the intelligence software world through part-time consulting work with a company called Veloxity, which is a private intelligence company. I also run a YouTube channel where I specialize in identifying disinformation, particularly regarding military conflict. So when this buzz began a few weeks ago, my hunch was that this sudden interest in UFOs was a result of a non-state actor who wanted to undermine confidence in America's government. The usual suspects. Russia, China, the government of Iran. So I logged into Cyabr, which is this powerful social threat detection tool. It's a tool that I use to identify disinformation spreaders and inauthentic actors. Uh, Cyabr lets me use it on a limited basis to conduct my research, and I barely found anything. In fact, the three largest spreaders of this event were TikTokers, content creators Philip DiAfranco, Average Joe, and the TikTok channel of the Showtime television network. So my theory was wrong. As far as I can tell, there was little, if any, inauthentic foreign influence. I believe that this UFO event was just a compelling story that people wanted to believe and was easily memeable. So then I got to thinking. Veloxity does a lot of work for the government and the private sector. And in the private sector, companies want to know who is doing what and why. They might want to understand why foreign actors are trying to destabilize a country, especially if they have substantial investments in that country. So if Veloxity came to me and asked me to write up an intelligence summary for a client as to whether or not we have been visited by aliens, how would I do it? Well, to start, I would use Intelligence Community Directive 203, or ICD-203, to express likelihood or probability. So let's base our thinking on three factors. The likelihood of intelligent life, a civilization in the universe. The likelihood that that civilization will discover us, and the likelihood of them actually traveling to Earth. Now, I consider myself to be a man of science and logic, and I know a little bit about the physics of nuclear power and nuclear weapons from my degree in engineering management and from my video on how nuclear weapons work. But I really didn't understand the scale of our galaxy until I started looking into it. And this terrified me. Now, I have to talk about numbers for a second. At some point, numbers don't matter. If I have $10 and I give you a dollar, how many dollars do I have? I got nine dollars. But if I have a million dollars and I give you a dollar, how many dollars do I have left? Let's get real, I still have a million dollars. So when dealing with time on a universal scale, we can't get wrapped around the axle about exact math. We, we can use round numbers. Now, a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. It's 5.88 trillion miles or 9.46 trillion kilometers. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, is roughly 87,400 light years wide, plus or minus uh, 3,590 light years. It's also about 1,000 to 3,000 light years thick. So for this example, I'm just going to ignore the thickness because it just screws the math up. But let me try to put the galaxy into perspective. If I took the Milky Way galaxy and I shrunk it down to the size of the United States, the center of the galaxy would be in Odin, Kansas. Our solar system is 26,500 light years from the center of the Milky Way. That would put it right about here, in the parking lot of the Wendy's in Biloxi, Mississippi. And the distance from the sun to the Earth would be roughly 0.74 of a millimeter. That would be about three-fifths the distance of a grain of sand that you would find 
in the parking lot of the Wendy's. So the distances we are talking about are enormous. Finding the Earth from the center of our galaxy would be like traveling from Odin, Kansas to the parking lot of a Wendy's in Biloxi, Mississippi, just to find a single grain of sand. And that's just our galaxy. There may be 100, 200 billion galaxies in the entire observable universe. There's this theory called the Great Filter by economist Robert Hansen, which helps explain why it seems like the universe is so devoid of life. The idea is that there are nine evolutionary steps on the road to intelligent life. But the more that I thought about it, the more I realized that the road to intelligent life isn't a filter as much as it is a TSA security checkpoint at the airport when you're traveling for a flight. There's things that you need to have and things that you can't have if you want to get past security for your interstellar flight. Carbon is your ID. Phosphorus is your boarding pass. The magnetosphere is your ride to the airport and you can't get on the plane with a gun. Let's start with your ID. Carbon. The top five elements by mass in the universe are hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, and neon. Now, the top five elements by mass in a human being are oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, and calcium. Carbon can form up to four stable bonds, and it's pretty important because it means it can bond to itself and create these chains of complex molecules that are necessary to support life. Now, it's theoretically possible that silicon, germanium, and even tin could form complex shapes, but they are heavier, rarer, and their bonds are weaker. Now, the top five elements are pretty evenly distributed across the galaxy, although there may be pockets where they are less abundant. If we think of the United States as a galaxy, and we think of each McDonald's in the United States as a solar system, then carbon is the McFlurry machine. Most McDonald's restaurants should have a McFlurry machine, so you could say that they are evenly distributed across every McDonald's. But as of today, June 29th, 2023, 13.8% of all McFlurries in the US are broken. So if you're in a solar system and you really want to form life, carbon would be ideal. But if the McFlurry machine is broken, for whatever reason you don't have carbon elements in your solar system, well, tough luck. You're gonna have to get cookies for dessert or maybe apple pie. Silicon is kind of like the cookies or apple pie at McDonald's. It's probably not gonna be your first choice or the best choice. But if you really want dessert, I suppose you could make do. So when it comes to bonding, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead can create four covalent bonds, just like carbon, and may theoretically create complex molecules, but the bonds aren't as strong as carbon and the elements are heavy and rare. Now, to get on the plane, you also need a boarding pass, which in this case is phosphorus. Hydrogen accounts for 74% of the mass of the universe, while helium contributes another 25%. Every other element in the universe exists in this little sliver here. Phosphorus is essential to all living things. It forms the backbone of DNA and RNA, and you need it for energy transfer in cells as part of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. And while some organisms like prokaryotes don't use ATP, all life that we know of uses phosphorus. So if all of the phosphorus in the solar system is stuck in a star or in the mantle of a planet, you're at a significant disadvantage for life, at least as we know it. Now we talk about the magnetosphere, which is kind of like your ticket insurance. Now everybody knows about weather satellites, and you typically think of weather satellites as looking at weather on the Earth. But there's also weather in space. There are solar storms, solar flares, cosmic rays, and radiation. In fact, astronauts that travel to Mars will suffer some pretty substantial cancer risks later in life from being exposed to all that radiation. One of two things that makes the Earth special is that we have a strong magnetic field that protects us from radiation. And at one point, the Moon did as well. The Moon acted like this second radiation shield that helped life develop complexity without the threat of excessive cell-destroying radiation. So the Moon protected us from the risk of developing cancer under the harsh radiation of the Sun, kind of like how ticket insurance protects you in case you can't make your flight. Now, if the magnetosphere is ticket insurance, Jupiter is kind of like the 
credit card company. This is the second thing that protects the earth. You know how when you buy a ticket with a credit card, it protects you from fraud? Jupiter protects the Earth because its gravity is so great that not a lot of asteroids get by Jupiter. It kind of acts like the Patrick Roy of planets. Most asteroids get drawn into Jupiter's gravity before they can make it to the inner planets. Now, the dinosaurs will tell you that the system isn't perfect, but the fact is that it seems like it works often enough for life to develop. So while there may be up to 40 billion planets that may be able to support life in our Milky Way galaxy, it may be a lot harder for life to develop if it's being bombarded by radiation and getting reset every couple of million years by a giant space rock. The final barrier is war. Let's say you remembered your ID, you have your boarding pass, you bought your trip insurance, but when you arrived at the airport, you forgot you were carrying your concealed carry pistol. Well, you're not getting on the plane. Even if all of the other criteria for life is there, a civilization might destroy itself in a nuclear or biological war, especially over resources when rapid industrialization makes fighting over those resources necessary. Climate change from industrialization may also play a role. We've come pretty close to destroying ourselves as a species a few times, and we're not out of the woods yet. When you think about it, any intelligent species probably got that way by their ability to recognize and mitigate threats. Or maybe by being the threat. And if you think war is just a human concept and some beings may evolve away from that, keep in mind that colony-based insects like ants, termites, and even hornets go to war with other colonies all the time, usually over territory. So in order for an intelligent civilization to exist in the first place, much less visit us, they have to live in a solar system with abundant carbon and enough phosphorus, be shielded from radiation and impact events, and not destroy themselves. Italian American physicist Enrico Fermi once speculated that there are billions of stars and billions of chances for life to develop, so where are all the aliens? Well, that's what I'm going to answer next. They might be there, but they haven't found us. In 1896, Italian inventor Guglielmo Marconi invented the wireless telegraph, radio. Those first few taps of Morse code are now about 125 light years away. In fact, if we look at our map, they're just passing the Second Street Bean Coffee House in Columbia, Mississippi, right about now. And when we send out radio waves, we're basically advertising our location for the entire universe to see. So if we use radio waves as a metric, the only people that might have received those signals are roughly within 125 light years. And that's assuming that aliens even detect the signals or they're looking for them in the first place. Intensity decreases with distance with something called the inverse square law. So at some point, it's impossible to tell radio photons from naturally occurring background radiation. Now, radio waves aren't the only thing that can prove intelligent life. There's another way of proving life, not intelligent life, but life, and that's oxygen. Yes, oxygen is one of the top five elements in the universe, but it is super reactive. So reactive that if all of the oxygen producing plants and algae on Earth just disappeared tomorrow, there would be no more oxygen on Earth after 4,000, 5,000 years. It would all bond to iron and become iron oxide or rust or be burnt up into carbon dioxide. So if we notice a plant with oxygen, the next question to ask is what's making all this oxygen? There's a technique called transit spectroscopy. Basically, when a star shines through the atmosphere of a planet, different molecules absorb very specific light colors. And if we notice that some of these light colors are missing, it means that these molecules are present. This allows us to infer the chemical makeup of the atmosphere of the planet and things like temperature and density of the molecules as well. An alien society looking towards Earth would have had about 2.4 to 3.5 billion years, which is roughly the amount of time since the emergence of oxygen producing life, to notice us and decide to check us out. And that is much further than light can travel since the invention of radio. So if aliens are out there, it's more likely that transit spectrography, not radio waves, would have revealed our location. So now we got to ask, why would they come here if they did notice us? So when it comes to travel, we have to start with some universal truths. 
Now, I don't want to get into the mechanics of common error because you could what if that to death. What if they have a warp drive? What if they use wormholes? Even if an alien race existed to begin with, and they somehow detected us out in the Wendy's parking lot, and they had the technology to travel between stars, why would they come? Well, exploration usually happens for five reasons. There's resources, trade, or money, religion, fame or vanity, scientific curiosity, and survival or defense. So the first item is resources, trade, or money. Now, an alien civilization may or may not have the concept of money or even trade, but they definitely will understand resources. No matter what kind of technology you have, you can't cheat physics. You're still a carbon-based life form that needs to sit inside of a can and go from one side of the galaxy to the other. And that's going to take some resources. So would an alien species come to Earth to get resources? I don't think so. I live in Silver Spring, Maryland. If I want a burger from the Wendy's, I'm going to go to Aspen Hill or Tacoma Park. I'm not going to travel all the way to Biloxi, Mississippi. Now, if it were the only Wendy's left in America, uh, you know, that might be worth the trip. I mean, people travel all the way to Bend, Oregon to visit the last Blockbuster store. But if you're at a technology level where you can travel to Earth to collect this resource, you probably have the technology to find this resource closer to home or find different ways of generating what you need. Think of it like how traveling to the last blockbuster in Bend, Oregon, just to rent a DVD of Time Cop would be a lot more resource intensive and expensive than just ordering a copy of Time Cop off Amazon. I mean, you could do it, but why would you? Next is religion. Now, you could argue that the Spanish conquered South America to convert the Native Americans to Christianity and save their souls. But if the main resource of South America was corn and not gold, how long do you think the first missionary would have stayed? The truth is that any aliens visiting Earth could have advanced their technology so far beyond what humans understand that they might have a set of religious beliefs that are incomprehensible. A new species of tree frog was discovered in the Andes Mountains this February, and a team of researchers from the Universidad San Francisco de Cueto in Ecuador cataloged the frog, but something tells me they didn't try to convert it to Catholicism. The frog wouldn't understand anyway. Any alien race that has the ability to move between stars would probably consider us about as receptive to their religion as a tree frog would be to Catholicism. So, I don't believe that religion is a valid reason for traveling to Earth. Fame or vanity is another reason explorers might travel to distant lands. Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay didn't climb Mount Everest because they wanted the mountain's resources. The expedition was primarily funded by the British government, and while there was data collected related to high-altitude physiology, it was secondary to the goal of just climbing the mountain. Now, I looked and I couldn't find any information on what the first expedition to summit Mount Everest cost, but I did look at what a current expedition to the mountain costs, and it's about $58,000, and that's to go up about 8.8 .8 kilometers. Not horrible, but it's, it's accessible to someone who's highly motivated and willing to save for a few years for a once-in-a-lifetime trip. Maybe he can even fundraise locally from businesses. They'll have their logo put in a banner that he takes up the mountain. But... Let's compare that to the cost per launch of going back to the moon on an Artemis mission. The Artemis mission costs about $1.4 billion per launch. You're going to need a bigger banner. And I'm not sure you can get there by fundraising. So if it costs $1.4 billion to travel 768,000 kilometers to the moon and back, that works out to about $5,338 per kilometer. If we use the same math to get to Alpha Centauri, which is our closest star, that would cost us this many trillion dollars. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Note for all you scientists out there, this might not be the most scientifically useful way of explaining this. The vast majority of the cost of a rocket launch is leaving Earth's gravity. Travel in space is cheap, and a voyage to Alpha Centauri would be overwhelmingly traveling in space, but you still have to get all that mass imp into space and then accelerate it out of the solar system. It takes a lot of delta V or change in velocity, and you'd have to slow down halfway to Alpha Centauri and you need reaction mass for that as well. There's no free lunch here. 
The Romans were a seafaring civilization. Imagine a Roman trying to estimate the cost of traveling from Italy to San Francisco, California, and they can't even use the Panama Canal. This is really hard to calculate. Now, aliens might not think in money, but they certainly think in resources. So would an alien civilization spend the resources they need to send an expedition to Earth for fame of the crew when due to the vast distances, it might be thousands of years before that crew returns with news of the visitation? So next is visitation for science. And I actually think this falls into the same category as fame or vanity. Sending an expedition to the Andes Mountains to look for a new species of tree frog isn't that expensive. And there could be some kind of resource gain from that. For example, the tree frog might secrete some kind of slime that kills cancer cells. Now, if we discovered signs of single-celled organisms on Mars, we'd probably go check that out. It would be expensive, but we would go. But let's say we found signs of single-celled organisms on Pluto. It would take nine to 12 years to even get there, and then they have to get back. And I don't see us planning a manned mission to Pluto for a maybe. Well, we'd definitely put it on the list, but it won't be at the top of the list. Now, if intelligent aliens discovered a sign of life on Earth, their scientists might want to go and check out this new sign of regenerating oxygen, but that doesn't mean the resource costs can be justified or it would even be authorized. A spacefaring civilization may consider going between planets like a trucker company delivering cargo between New York and Los Angeles. Not cheap, but doable. But is the trip worth the cost? Finally, there's survival and defense. I think this is the most likely case for alien contact, especially if the alien planet is suffering from some kind of calamity. I'm sure that some of you have read the Dark Forest trilogy by Lu Xin. Uh, this Dark Forest hypothesis basically says that any spacefaring civilization would be a threat to any other spacefaring civilization. Information cannot travel faster than light. That would violate causality. So it might make logical sense for the aliens to wipe us out as soon as we're detected because we may experience exponential growth in between observations. The spear was invented about half a million years ago. The bow was invented about 60,000 years ago. Gunpowder was invented 700 years ago. Aircraft, submarines, nuclear weapons were all invented within the past 100 years or so. If our technology increases at an exponential rate, it would make more sense to wipe us out as soon as possible because we may start competing for galactic resources. So the fact that we're still alive as a planet may actually be proof that we haven't been visited. It's just too risky to let us live as a species. And to make matters even worse for aliens, all of the solar systems in our galaxy are moving. There's a finite window for observation. You might only get a 10,000 Earth year window to look at Earth and you won't get another chance to see what's going on. But then again, if there was another civilization in our Milky Way wiping out other civilizations with advanced technology, it would probably make some noise. Why haven't we detected them? So I don't think we've been visited by aliens who want to destroy us because we would already be dead. Now, a few disclaimers. Since the Earth is the only planet we know of with life, I'm using a data set of one, Earth. There may be other life forms that we can't even imagine, and scientists are really good at imagining things. So let's break it down using ICD-203. What is the likelihood of intelligent life in the galaxy? An equation by Dr. Frank Drake tried to estimate this with the following formula. This formula takes into account things like the average rate of star and planet formation, but the last three inputs in the equation are values that can't be known and are difficult to estimate. So, Based on what we've observed about the galaxy, it seems that life is rare and needs very special conditions in order to even have a chance of forming intelligent life. But since there are so many solar systems in the galaxy, I think there's a roughly even chance for intelligent life and a civilization developing. Next question, what is the likelihood of an alien civilization discovering us? Based on the fact that oxygen has been produced on this planet for between 2.4 and 3.5 billion years, I think there is a roughly even chance that we could be detected by intelligent life. However, since the aliens still need to know where to point their transit spectropia machine, everything needs to be aligned for it to work in the first place, and space is pretty big, 
I think that actually brings it down to a very unlikely. Geometry is just against them. Finally, what is the likelihood of an alien civilization actually traveling to the Earth? Any civilization that has the ability to travel between stars that needs resources can probably find it somewhere other than Earth or develop alternatives. Religion would be like preaching to a tree frog. Fame and vanity is too resource intensive, and scientific curiosity might fall into the same bucket as fame, although scientists with their curiosity about the universe might disagree. Research always takes funding. Defense or survival is really the only reasonable explanation for traveling to our solar system. And the fact that we're still alive as a species only tells us that we haven't been visited. So I would call this almost no chance. There is almost no chance that we have been visited. Remember back in the beginning of the video where I said, my goal in this video is not to disparage or discredit the remarks of anyone who testified. Well, how can I come to a conclusion without discrediting the men who testified in front of Congress? There's a documentary on Netflix called Sour Grapes. It's about a wine fraud criminal named Rudy. And yeah, I said wine fraud. If you watch the documentary, you'll be exposed to the secret world of rich, pretentious, snobby people who collect rare and expensive wines and occasionally serve them at parties to other rare, pretentious, snobby people. Rudy was finally brought down when he tried to auction off a bottle of Domaine Saint Denis from the years 1945, 1949, and 1966. Only problem, Domaine Saint Denis wasn't produced until 1982. So if you're one of those people of a bottle of 1946 Domaine, you might think that you have something real. I mean, you can, you can hold it in your hand, it's tangible, but it's already been proven that it's impossible for this bottle to be real. Based on logic and science and the fact that you can't cheat physics, the odds of an alien civilization visiting us and not having wiped us out is almost no chance. Near zero. The bottle of wine just isn't real. I'd like to thank Dr. Ushin Kreener, Assistant Professor of Physical Sciences at Dublin City University, Professor Marco Thiel of the University of Aberdeen in the United Kingdom, Andy Silver, PhD, PhD student Robin Mental, University College Dublin, PhD student Ethan from uh, Northumbria University, PhD student Roland Timmerman from Leiden Observatory, Keen, uh, Keen Halls from Bangor University, Scott Madison, a smarty pants from New Mexico Tech, Ryan Frizee, a cosmologist from University of Kansas, and Brian Drower, a professional astrophotographer. Any mistakes I've made are solely my own. All of the Google Earth files I used in this video can be found for free on my Substack, which you can find in the pinned comments below. Thank you for watching. Mr. President? Yeah, that's me. I'm the president, man. Hey, little tugboat, did someone drop your anchor? Ah, uh, it's three o'clock in the morning, Mr. President. Well, it's not like you got some girl in bed with you to wake up. Listen, you freaking nerd, I've got a problem. It's my vice principal, man. You're who? Come on, man! Camilla! Miss Harris, if you're nasty. She's got a Nerf Day coming up, man. I, I gotta get her a presentation. Oh, Mr. President, I how about a Ryan Beth t-shirt from Bunker Branding? I've got Think Outside the Bomb, Live Laugh Launch, Repatriate and for High Mars, Department of the Boat People, Landmine Marker shirts, and even Hell on a Wire. A lot of these come in hoodies and stickers as well. Yeah, I'll get a Ryan Beth t-shirt from Bunker Branding. Macbeth, he saved the reputation of the tight house. The, not the tight house, the, the tight house. The, the, the building, man, with the rose garden. Get with the program, man. Happy to help, Mr. President. And be sure to get yours at BunkerBranding.com.